This week on Business Mike, the business of yogurt. My guest today is Ehime Eigbe. She's the founder and CEO of Sweet Kiwi, a Nigerian-based frozen yogurt bar which sells premium frozen yogurt in over a hundred flavors. In today's show, Ehime shares her inspiration for starting a frozen yogurt business in Nigeria, the challenges involved in running a franchise, and tips on how to avoid common mistakes made by startup entrepreneurs. All this and more next on Business Mike. You're listening to the Business Mike podcast. Amazing interviews with inspiring entrepreneurs. For more amazing interviews, go to www.businessmike.com or download our podcast every Monday from Pod Africa. Hello and welcome to another episode of Business Mike. My name is Daudi Mugabe and joining me today is Ehime. Ehime, can you just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and what you do? Uh, my name is Ehime Egbe Akindele. Um, my, I'm the founder, CEO of Sweet Kiwi Frozen Yogurt. Sweet Kiwi is a frozen yogurt company that was started in 2011. The whole idea of Sweet Kiwi was to bring healthy dessert options to Nigeria at the time uh, because we had nothing that was healthy dessert-wise at the time. I came to Nigeria on holiday and I noticed that there was a gap in the market. Um, And it stayed with me because I came in 2009. And at the time, I worked for Citigroup. And, you know, it was quite, um, it was a nice job. I was a bankruptcy litigator. And um, I didn't think I could run a business at the time, to be frank. Uh, I never saw myself as a business owner. I've always seen myself as a career person, you know, becoming the CEO of of City. That was probably my, my, my goals at the time, or maybe working for the UN. Those were my goals. Um, but yes, so uh, five years later, uh, Sweet Kiwi is a well-known brand in Nigeria. I've listened to your story on other platforms, and you mentioned that while you're at, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, was it Citigroup when you decided I'm going to go ahead and start the company? Yes. So what is it about yogurt in particular that made you want to start your own business? Because sometimes we experience something nice and we just leave it at that. But in your case, you actually wanted to go a step further and get involved as a business owner. What was it about the experience or the product that made you make that leap? It was interesting because a friend of mine at work at City, her name was Nancy. Uh, We would always go to lunch together. And every time I wanted to get real food, she would always say, no, let's get frozen yogurt. And I always thought she was crazy. And I'm like, nah, who's having yogurt for lunch? Because I always imagined those little yogurt packs at the supermarkets, you know, so I would just never agree to go. But one day I said to her, "Okay, fine, I guess we could get yogurt because I was trying to be healthy that day. And when we finally went into the store, it was a feeling you know, that you can't describe. Just being in the space, everything just looks so white, so bright, so pretty. And the experience, the experience of having to serve yourself a, um, cups, a, a full cup with toppings. I, I've, I, it was just a feeling that I could, a very warm, happy feeling that I couldn't explain. I remember filling up my cup, paying for it and thinking to myself, my sisters are not going to let me eat this by myself. So <laughs> I went back and got two other cups from my other sisters because I wasn't going to share <laughs> and uh, when you moved back home, obviously there was a niche for you there because nobody was actually doing that. So how difficult was it to start that sort of culture, something you had experienced abroad in Nigeria? It was um, a double-edged sword, I have to say, because people didn't understand what frozen yogurt was. How you know, Some people didn't understand it, some people weren't interested, but some people were really curious, which actually really worked for us. Because if you called, because when I got to Nigeria, I was trying to find a location, I couldn't find one. And I noticed the trend in Nigeria that people were very big on events and weddings. So I thought to myself, how about we start doing events and, you know, try to use that to break into the market? Because finding a a place to rent in Nigeria is so expensive, especially when you're a small business. There's so many expenses that come with that. So we decided to start approaching a lot of event planners to see if they were willing to have us come to events. The one thing I have to say that being a new product in the market did for us is that almost 100% of the people you contact would give you an audience because you're talking about something they've never heard of. With time, uh, especially where I am in Uganda, sometimes when you come in with a new product or service, uh, when it becomes successful, other people try and create a similar service. Have you had that experience in Nigeria? And if so, what do you do to make yourself stand out from the rest? I I have, actually. We've had um, a few other yoga companies 
Um, funny enough, all the companies are, um, are all international brands brought in as franchises, which works in our favor because, because we're not a franchise and I started the company myself, we're very flexible with like our products and our services and we can fine tune that to the people, the local people and what their tastes are. One thing I like to do is I'm a brand person, like I love branding. So we try to stay ahead of the market by making sure that our branding, our store designs, uh, the experience that the customer has is, is, is surpasses any other yoga brand, not only in Nigeria, but in the world as a whole. I actually um, take time to, I spend months in China developing new spoon designs, new cup designs. Uh, we actually have a new cup coming out and it shows all the big um, monuments in Nigeria. We try to personalize it. And also when it comes to our products, we also try to localize them. We've come up with a lot of innovative flavors. Um, there's a, a drink called Zobo. It's really popular in Nigeria. It's hibiscus leaves and ginger. We did a flavor of that. We've done flavors of a lot of local fruits. And we've been able to partner with a lot of uh, big companies. Uh, we've grown through a lot of partnerships. We've, we've created a lot of um, flavors for a lot of uh, brands, a lot of drink brands like Coca Coke, uh, um, Pepsi. We've done work for Bailey's. We've done work for Belvedere Vodka, Moet and Chandon. So those things, you know, make us stand out and keep us way ahead above the curve. One of the things you mentioned actually got my attention, designing new spoons. What do you mean by that? Like how, <laughs> what, what does a different spoon design look like? Yes. So we um, try to do things that excite the customer, things that are different and just add to the customer's experience, basically. And for the spoons, initially, we designed like a, a green spoon with a very long stem. Um, but we've used that for four years and we felt that we needed to keep innovating um, and keep designing because I'm part of the school of thought that believes that um, design is a key strategy um, for um, growing a business. Right. And the name itself, Sweet Kiwi, that, that's just very, very unique in its own way. So how did that come about? Um, I, Sweet Kiwi is actually like an urban word uh, it's something that's used here in america for something that's unusual because kiwi are can kiwis normally as a fruit the kiwi fruit is sour so if you find a sweet kiwi it's something that's very rare um so i thought that it, it kind of aligned with the brand message i wanted to send out which was a very unique product because i took a lot of time to develop our yogurt recipes and the way our service was going to be provided. So I thought that that was going to be that name, Sweet Kiwi, because I went through so many names um, and I just felt that that name, Sweet Kiwi, represented everything that the brand had to say. And uh, earlier on, when you mentioned that starting the company, you had to leave your employment. For those people listening right now who maybe want to start a business, but they perhaps don't have the courage to go ahead and leave their jobs. What is it in your particular case that made you um, make the decision to go ahead and start your business without necessarily having to worry too much about the consequences? It's a scary thing, I have to admit. It wasn't a very easy decision. But at the time when I decided to go into frozen yogurt, at first I didn't think I was going to leave my job. Um, but when I started training to do the um, to learn how to make frozen yogurt, I just fell in love with everything. And as that, as that went on, I noticed I was no longer interested in my job. There was just no interest, you know, and it, it was a dis disservice to the company if my interests were no longer there. You know, you'd be, I would be at work from seven to four and, you know, I would probably leave work at four and go for training at 5 p.m. And I'd probably get home at 1 p.m. But, and I'd be so dead tired but the funniest thing was from 5 p.m. to 1 p.m. was the most exciting time of my life, of my day. Being around something that you're so passionate about, just the passion of actually learning to do something. Um, I literally built the brand from scratch. I did the design, logo design. Um, I, I did everything myself and put it together. So it was something that I was quite in love with, I have to say. Um, it took all my passion. Like I was so passionate about it. So I've noticed that once you're passionate about something and you're really interested in it, you're just you're just ready to spend all of your waking hours and everything that you have and invest it 
And it gets to that point where it's no longer, you're no longer scared to make that decision, you know? You have had both worlds in terms of, you know, the professional career and the business owner path as well. So how has entrepreneurship in particular changed you as a person? Oh, wow. It's like, you know, before you become a mother and then when you become a mother and you become this whole person, I have become this person that I never thought I, I could ever be. I do every, like it, it was a time in my life when I did everything for the company. I did everything. I, I was the cleaner. I was the, the CEO. I was the, the fire person, putting out fires every day. I, I've just grown so much as a person that in the ways that I never thought I could grow, you know, coming from a professional environment, I feel like I've been able to see two sides of the coin because when I worked for City, I had a boss. And when he would tell me some things that I felt like wasn't a good decision, you know, it would come off to me like, oh, you know, these corporate things. But when you're on the other side of it and you're the boss and you're giving all these instructions that other people are now not so happy about, you know, you begin to understand things a lot better. How do you handle that dynamic in terms of, you know, getting your vision across to the employees you have? Because the last thing you want is to have people that are there just for the money that aren't invested in your vision as well. So how do you keep everybody happy and at the same time pumped up to go ahead for the mission? One thing that I'm... I like to do is to always share the vision, always make the employees part of the process. I I am a big believer in owning your process as an employee for me to work for me. You need to own your process from start to finish. And if you're not able to do that, you really can't work in the company. And I'm 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 not that kind of boss who just has all these ideas and all these plans and I don't share. I share everything. Even when we go through difficult periods, even if it's like a little thing, no matter how small, no matter how big, I, we, we have monthly village meetings. That's why I call them. And in the village meetings, we just talk generally about the direction of where the company is going, where we would like to go, how the employees can contribute to that, you know, the, what they bring to that. And we try to also compensate them really well. Um, I think we, we currently pay the highest of any um, dessert store in Nigeria where we're located. Um, and... We also try to give a lot of benefits. We do employee of the month. We give out cinema tickets. We do bonuses. We just try to keep them interested and excited and, and to buy into the company. During one of your interviews in another platform, you mentioned that sometimes you have, um, as an entrepreneur, you tend to buy things that you do not necessarily need because when you're starting out, there's that excitement of, you know, it has to look like this, it must have that. And then when you get started, you realize we actually don't need all this stuff. Can you, um, through your experience, just share with us a couple of things that maybe you did that you didn't need and also a few of the things that, that are general in terms of entrepreneurs making the mistake of buying stuff that they don't need really? Yes, uh, I'm a firm, I, I think from my experience, I always tell people when they say, oh, I want to do this business and I don't have this money, I always try to tell them, you, you know, you don't need all this money sometimes because when you do have the money, you make a lot of buying mistakes because I did. I, I felt like, oh, this is the brand, you know, it's pink and it's green. So all our plastics for mixing the yogurt have to be pink and green, doesn't matter the cost. You know, I bought all these things that we really didn't need functionally did not need because we hadn't started the business at that time. We're just about to start. When you actually start the business day to day, mixing the yogurt, making the yogurt, pointing it into the machine, you don't really care about the colors of the plastics. Just a nice clean plastic would do. Uh, The mixers, I bought the most expensive uh, immersion blenders and all these things. And being in a country like Nigeria where power is very unstable, you can buy a blender that, that, that costs a thousand dollars and it, it's, it goes bad the next day because of a power surge. You know, you start to learn and you start to learn quickly. That, that's the challenge I had as well. There's a movie library I started and, uh, well, majority of these things come from the branding. There's a particular look you want to have. And so you invest so much in the look and very little in the process because you've not yet gotten your hands dirty in terms of getting the groundwork done. So your hands end up being burnt with time, but you learn and that's, that's the good thing. Yeah. So now I'm the person who I cut budgets, cut it down, cut it down. What don't we need on this list? Let's cut it down. I'm no longer in love with the whole, let's be fancy, let's be, 
you know, even all about, you know, the the look and the feel. I'm always about the look and the feel in the store, in the customer experience. But, you know, I'm all about cost cutting and making sure that we reach our goals, you know, at the at minimum cost. Right now, I've seen images of your stores and I must say they really look spectacular. Personally, they just remind me of Christmas because of the variety of colors and it's it's very, very engaging and wonderful to see, including the yogurts themselves, the sprinkles you have. It's very well done in, in both stores that you have at the moment. Thank you. So just now we've been talking about, you know, spending the money when you don't necessarily have to, but you obviously grew to a point whereby you started to um, start out other stores. So at what stage would you advise people to maybe branch out and start another store? And how did you go about that in your case? Uh, For me, our first store uh, was born out of the event industry. We started doing events. We were really big in events. We were doing, we literally, we're doing almost every single company in Nigeria, and we were working really hard. And we had a habit of saving. Uh, so when it came, when the opportunity to get a new uh, location came around, we were available. Um, we were able to take take the opportunity because we we've been planning for it and we've been working hard to make sure that we had the funding for it. Um, so the first store was really successful naturally. A lot of people start saying, oh, when are you going to expand? When are you going to go into another store? So we got the second store a year after the first one. I wouldn't personally say, I think looking back in retrospective, I wouldn't say it was the best decision, but we've been able to make it work. And we're actually currently working on a third store. But for people, I would advise that, you know, you need to lay the groundwork initially properly. Um, before you expand. Expansions can kill a business. You have experience managing one store and two. How does it change when you have to manage two stores instead of the one? And how far apart are they? Do you have to move you know, from one to the other to make sure everything is okay? How do you manage that process? It was at first we just thought, okay, we have things. The first store is working really well. We have things in order. We have a process. All we have to do is copy and paste this onto the next store. So the next store is at the Palms Mall, which is not too far away from the first store. That, that, that was actually a, a blessing because if it was any further away, we probably wouldn't have been able to manage. Um, and then we tried to recreate the same formula in the other store, but it didn't work because at first we went through a lot of challenges because things changed. Suddenly there was a lot of changes with staffing, with personnel, making sure that, you know, People were doing things the same way it was done in the first store. Uh, also, um, stock, making sure that we have enough stock, where where we have enough cups, we have enough spoons. All of a sudden, we ju- it just seemed like we didn't have enough of anything anymore. And you know, I think I think that we were not really p- properly positioned for that expansion, but we've been able to make it work, and we've been able to recover from the initial hits that that took. Um, and we've been able to put together a very stable team. Uh, so we have managers that manage each store. And then I have like an operations manager that manages both stores. If you could go back in time um, with all your experience and give yourself a piece of advice uh, through a lesson you've learned from this journey to yourself as you're beginning, what would you tell yourself about the journey you're about to go on? Ah, I would say... You're going to be very stressed out. You're going to be very tired. There's some days that you're going to cry. You're going to cry a lot, a lot, in fact. But it's going to be the best time of your life. Very many people during the interviews and uh, promotions of their businesses, there's an image whereby everything is okay, everything looks good, there's nothing wrong, I've made it. But just like you've said, there are those days whereby, I don't know, maybe you're not in the mood or things are just not going right. How do you then get yourself back on track? What, what do you do in your particular case to make you once again motivated for the business? I think that you need to have a support system. It's very important. I love my business. I love what I do. But I can't tell you how many times I just feel like I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. It, it's too hard. Or because um, you, you understand how it works in Nigeria. Things are so difficult. We have all this harassment from the government. We don't get any supports. Um Things can be so difficult. There are days where we have shipments that are supposed to come in, but the customs have just seized them for no reason other than the fact that they want a bribe. And 
the whole world seems like it's falling apart because everything you put into place just doesn't work the way it would work in a normal society. Those days, I think that you need a support system because I have days where I'm just crying, I'm frustrated, and my family is there to support me, or my mom is there to pick up from where pick up where I've left off because sometimes I can't do it all by myself. Or I have friends who who just come around and say, you know what, what do you need? What do you need us to do today? We know that you're tired. We know you're done. How can we help? And they just pick up where I've left off because sometimes you can't do it all by yourself. And I also believe in mentorship. You need to get a mentor who has been through it, who can tell you. Um, I don't know, uh, Tara Tara Toye, she's been, uh, she's the head of House of Tara. She's been a very big mentor for me. Uh, I've I've had a lot of mentors and 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 someone like uh, Mrs. Jorotoye, she's one of the people. She set up this big House of Tara cosmetic company, and she's always supported me and always been there as a mentor to tell me, you know, you just hang in there when days are hard and when I want to quit, you know. Or she she just keeps saying, just hang in there, it'll get better, it'll get better. And those words always stay with me. Right. So that was the downside. Let's look at the upside now. What's your favorite moment at uh, Sweet Kiwi? Oh, I was saying my best. I've had so many great moments. I have to say I've met a lot of amazing people that I didn't think I'd ever get to meet. Uh, the business has off, uh, afforded me a lot of opportunities. But I would say my best moment that I remember, even though I wasn't really in the moment, was the opening of our first store. It was, it was actually I had an out of body experience the whole day, the whole day. I felt like I was in myself. I just felt like I was floating through the whole store. There were so many people there. It was so successful. The roads had cars lined up all the way to the end. And I just had an out of body experience. I really wasn't physically there. Right. And uh, your favorite flavor of yogurt? Ah, oh, that's hard. That is hard. It's like asking me to choose a favorite scar- a star in the sky. That is so hard. Like I, it's very, very hard. I can't tell you how hard that is right now. Cause I'm that kind of person. I, maybe I like blueberry right now, but then I get tired. Then I fall in love with something else. And then I'm obsessed with that thing. And then I'm obsessed with another flavor. And then we create another flavor and I'm like, this is my best one. And then we create another one and that's my best one. So it's really, really difficult. <laughs> Well, final question is, if you were cast away to a desert island and you could take three items and one of each, which book would you take with you? Which movie would you take with you? And which song would you take with you? Ah, this is really hard. Hmm. Okay. The book I would take with me would be the Bible because I'm going to need that to keep saying on this island where I can't talk to anybody. (laughs) And then a movie. Oh, wow. That's really hard. A really, really tough one. I love, I'm a big movie buff. So um, let me see. A movie. Well, I like, actually, my favorite movie would be Memoirs of a Geisha. You know, I like that movie because it's a life lesson. Sometimes you're not always, you're just born into a life. And you have to make the best of it. The last one. What's the last thing? The last one was a song. Yes, my favorite song. Yes, Now We Are Free. It's the soundtrack to The Gladiator. It's just something about the song. You know, funny enough, it's not even in English. You don't really mm-hmm. understand the words. But the, the composition, the, the sound, if I was on a private island, in, on an island by myself, that's what I want to listen to. Now we are free. Now I am free. You know, um, it's kind of like a transition song, but it's actually a beautiful song, a soul searching song. So probably be on the island doing a lot of soul searching. And uh, how can people get in touch with you or learn more about Sweet Kiwi on uh, through your website, email, social media and all that? Uh, you can uh, go to our website. It's www.sweetkiwiyogurt.com. Yogurt is Y-O-G-U-R-T. Uh, we're at Instagram at Sweet Kiwi Yogurt. Once again, yogurt is Y O G U R T. We're also on Twitter at Sweet Kiwi. That's Sweet Kiwi with an E at the end. We're on Facebook as well, facebook.com slash Sweet Kiwi with an E at the end. Um, I'm, you can send an email to me at info at Sweet Kiwi Yogurt.com, Y O G U R T. Um, and what would I like to say? Yes, healthy never tasted better. Right. Well, thank you so much, Ahime, for taking the time to share with us your journey and experiences. And we wish you the very best with Sweet Kiwi. Thank you so much, Daddy. It's really nice to have been on this show. 
Thanks for listening to the Business Mike podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to listen to more episodes just like this one, simply go to businessmike.com. I would love to hear from you. So if you've got any questions or feedback, you can reach me on Twitter at Daudi Mugabe, on Facebook at Business Mike, or email that's Daudi at businessmike.com. Don't forget, we have a brand new episode every Monday. And until then, take care.